Pues nada, bienvenidos. Eh, tenemos hoy con nosotros a Brice Turner, eh, que es para mí un placer presentarle. Lo conozco desde hace unos cuantos años, yo creo que más o menos cuando empezó a meterse más en profundidad en todos estos temas de los que nos va a hablar hoy, o por lo menos yo lo recuerdo así, de las clases del Máster de Economía Austriaca. Eh, de, con discusiones pues muy, muy acaloradas e intensas <ríe> sí. sobre temas de praxeología bueno, y otras eh, él, él es belga, aunque de adopción ya madrileño sí. y bueno, aún así eh, va a dar la conferencia hoy en, in, en inglés que creo que eso no estaba eh, anunciado de esa manera eh, pero bueno, igualmente yo creo que para la mayoría no va a ser ningún problema y y bueno, para presentarlo a él un poquito, él actualmente es editor jefe en eh, Macrotrends, sí. que es un proyecto en el que aplica la teoría de la economía austríaca, ciclos económicos, sí. a la inversión. Y también colabora con Procesos de Mercado, con la revista de Procesos de Mercado. Nos viene a hablar, pues, como ven, del de problema de la praxeología, eh, va a hablar de metodología de Mises, va a compararla con la de Menger. Y bueno, y este es un tema que trata él en su tesis doctoral. Um, y bueno, va a ser pues un poco como un, no sé introducción, si una, una digamos, introducción sí. a, a ese tema. Pues nada, que lo disfruten y muchas gracias por venir. Gracias, Inés. Eso me permitéis que voy a seguir en, eh, en, eh, en inglés, aunque mi castellano ha mejorado mucho, pero todavía no para discusiones muy abstractos. So, uh, the problem with praxeology is my title, um, and to start with a very important announcement, I will not say that Mises is wrong. I fear the libertarian community too much that they would start chasing me on the street if I would say that. I will uh, merely show that I think that uh, Menger is more profitable in his epistemological um, uh, assumptions. So I don't know who will do the presentation. Uh, you can forward it. Uh. Uh, yeah. okay. Sorry. Ah, here, okay, yeah. sorry, I didn't know. Sorry. <coughs> yep. Okay, so my, my presentation will have uh, uh, three uh, big parts. I will explain what, in my view, is the problem with praxeology. Then I will uh, try to uh, refound uh, 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 economics and theory in general on a different metaphysics. And then I will show why metaphysics is, is relevant for economics, because that is not very evident, I think, to have a metaphysical analysis about, about economics. Um, let's start with some definitions, which are free. Uh, these, these are my definitions, so nobody has to agree with them. But I, I think that uh, to be subjective is simply to hold opinion. Uh, some people will hold the opinion that it is warm in this, uh, in this uh, um, room. Uh, I am one of them. Other people will say, well, it's not that warm. This is subjective. This has to be uh, distinguished from subjectivist. Uh, subjectivist is, is, a, is a much more profound uh, way of looking at reality. It is to actively acknowledge that we can only hold opinion. And this is very radical because uh, some people might think, well, uh, subjectivism and relativism or nihilism is not far from each other. You know, if you say that everything is an opinion, well, then you are actually saying or might be saying that there is no objective reality. So, you know, that would be a nihilist uh, assumption. I will show that this is not the case, but let's um, look at how our intellectual development works um, in, in, my, in my experience. Huh? We start out with, as children with subjective points of view. Huh? We have all kinds of opinions. And then uh, when we get a bit older, uh, we notice that other people ha have also uh, points of view that are subjective. And we feel the need to objectify this, you know, if everybody has a subjective point of view, how can we make peace? How we ha can we have a society? And then the danger exists that you will take your own subjective point of view and impose it on other people. And that is what I call objectivism. Uh, um, the, the, an, an objectivist is somebody who thinks that his own subjective opinion is objectively true. Um, And th this has to be uh, 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 distinguished from objective, uh, um, which is yet another uh, um, uh, well, designation. And I define it as to refrain from any opinion. Huh? A wise man 
can be called objective because he remains silent about, about uh, opinions. He knows that uh, subjectivism is radical, so uh, it's, it's, it's a transcendental attitude. So if, if we put it in a, in a scheme, I have all my definitions here, you could say that um, subjective is what is real for one person. Um, and when you, when you uh, take your own reality and you, you impose it on others, well, you can get at surreal situations where people have to believe stuff that nobody believes, but because one person has power, uh, uh, can, can lay his subjective opinion upon others. Uh, things start to become surreal, like for instance uh, that life in the in, in, in Soviet Union was, was good to live. Uh? That was the objective opinion, <laughs> not, not shared by most, but, but imposed on people. Um, and I would, call that, I would say that subjectivism is the most realistic attitude. Uh? Uh, uh, there are a lot of subjective uh, ways to look at reality, and if we compare our subjective impressions, we might get at something intersubjective without implying that objectivity exists. Okay, that's a heavy entry, but my, my point is a bit that um, there's still some objectivism left in Mises, something uh, Menger did not have. So now we can start with the analysis of the Misesian system. And, oh, sorry, I think I, I, I went too fast. Something is wrong with the... Uh, it, this, okay. Well, you can characterize the Misesian system in many ways, but in my subjective opinion, you can characterize it by three central tenets. Huh? His claim is that human action is an undeniable axiom. That's the first one. Then he says that all action is rational. And the third one, which I find very important, and it does not receive a lot of attention, is the, the, the expulsion of psychology. Mises does not want to accept psychological arguments. Let's have a closer look. Um, first of all, is human action really an axiom? The general definition of an axiom is a proposition that you need, um, if you try to deny the proposition, you need the proposition. So you enter in a, in a performative contradiction when you try to deny this proposition. That is, that is what makes it axiomatic. And one e example uh, by Ayn Rand, uh, existence exists is, is her axiom on, on which everything is built. And her argument is, well, if you want to deny existence, well, then you have to deny yourself because you at least exist. So I don't think it's a, it's a valid uh, kind of reasoning, but it is to illustrate how axioms are legitimized. Now, if you apply this to human action, what Mises says is that, you know, if you have to deny human action, well, you are performing a human action, you are denying. So, this is like the rock-solid basis of his theory, and this is also the, the root of uh, praxeology. And it seems an invincible position, you know. But I do think that there is a, a flaw, um, and it's a philosophical uh, point, but it's not an unimportant point. The point is that from the experience of himself as being human, Mises cannot impute humanity onto others. Um, this is actually a non sequitur. It's not because I feel human that you are all human. I cannot know that. I can presume that. I can believe that. But I cannot prove that. So on the basis of this apodictical uh, axiom is actually under the basis of this apodictical axiom is actually an assumption, which is psychological. It's a psychological assumption that we have that other people are human. And I have the example of, uh, of Mr. Data. Uh, well, I will tell it now. Uh, I don't know if this generation still has, um, has some references to the, the series Star Trek. Uh, there you have a, a, an android, uh, which is uh, called Data. And he has, um, he's very human-like. But he has yellow eyes, he has, uh, his skin is a bit different, and he, he doesn't understand humor. His programmation is not, is not well fitted enough. And he said, wait, well, you can, you can recognize androids, we can know that they are androids. But can we logically exclude that this technology has been perfected and that I am an android? Nobody can prove or disprove that I, that I am human or inhuman. 
And you might think it's far-fetched, but it has to do with the assumptions that people have about reality. And I will dig deeper into that. I just want to touch the point right now. So it's, it's a non sequitur to think that because I experience myself as human, that others are human as well. I will de delve deeper into this, but first the three points. And then the point I like most of, of all, um, is all action rational? Well, he says literally, human action is necessarily always rational. Uh, so uh, that's actually a, a, a humble point of view. He, 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 he would never say, Mises would never say, well, what you are doing is irrational because he's modest. And that's a good thing when, when you are confronted with radical uncertainty. Um, it's, it is, it is uh, uh, how do you say that? Uh, but the Misesian definition of rationality is very specific. It actually, I always interpret it as being meaningful. A, a certain person does something and we can judge that as irrational, but we cannot, we cannot say that it has to be meaningful to that person or else he wouldn't do it. So that is, that is a basic assumption. And then, well, you are confronted with an interesting question. If all human action is rational, well, uh, is it irrational then to deny the human, axiom, uh, human action axiom? So you could say, well, uh, the, the axiom of human action is apodictically sure, and even though it's apodictically sure, I choose to deny it. Well, then, then you cannot use, in the Misesian terminology, then you cannot say, well, that's irrational. No, you must acknowledge that this person, you know, uh, denies the axiom with good reason. It must be meaningful for him to deny it. And then the third point uh, is closely correlated to that. Well, after that, you have said to this person, well, you're free to deny the axiom when you're alone with libertarians, you will say, well, what a strange guy, you know, he doesn't even accept logic. Um, and mm, the point I'm trying to make is that um, <coughs> it's vital for the theory of Mises to exclude all psychological arguments or else it would not hold true anymore. Um, he is unaware that his um, axiom is actually a psychological projection. So uh, it's very logical that he excludes psychology. What, what does he take as psychology? He takes something else. He calls it themology. And themology is actually a, a, a reduction of psychology. It's the study of the conscious contents of the human mind. So uh, all ideas people have historically, how intellectual history would be a, a perfect example of themological analysis. But themology is, is much more limited than psychology. And I don't know why, why this goes so fast. Right. I do one. Okay. Um, this is the, 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 the model of the psyche I, 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 have, uh, I have designed. Um, and uh, if you look at the, the gray barrier, that would be the barrier between our conscious uh, thinking, logical mind and our unconscious. And um, well, you could call the upper part, you could call that the logical part. And that's the part where Mises is with his themology. But he cuts it off at the, the border of what is unconscious. And this is a methodological choice. I don't say that that is the wrong thing. But it does um, limit your analysis of human action to deliberate, purposeful action. While Menger um, actually spent the last 20 years of his life, starting from 1900, to try and found his uh, methodology on a purely psychological basis. For people who want to know more about that, read Emil Cauder, uh, 1965. Uh, it's actually in the history of marginal utility, but uh, he has a, an important chapter on, on Mengerian, Mengerian methodology and his assumptions. And I have to thank uh, Dr. Bagus for, for this tip because I learned a lot from that book. So if, if you only take Mises, you have a, a reduction of human action. This is, this is my, my point. One ahead. So let's apply this, for instance. This is denying Danny. He, he denies everything, you know. Um, but what attitudes should we take towards a person that purposefully denies the human, uh, human action axiom? It's always action axiom. Can we call him irrational? Can we do that? Or can we uh, admit that, you know, the Misesian uh, 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 <coughs> conception of rationality is maybe too narrow? Uh, because if he uh, claims that Mises cannot prove that he is human, 
well, the whole Misesian defense uh, falls down. So are there objective reasons to call Dani irrational for not accepting the, the human, human action axiom? So I talked to you about Mr. Data. Uh, uh, I think it's a very important point. It's about the, um, um, the incertitumbre, el, el, uh, the, um, the uncertainty. Uh, it's not limited to other people. Uh, we can make it bigger even. You could even say, are we actually certain that what we observe as the external reality is true? And this is the, the thought experiment that has been the subject of a, of a trilogy, which is called The Matrix. And I would, uh, if you haven't seen the movie, I would surely uh, advise you to see it because it's a very philosophical movie. Uh, how can we be sure that um, objective reality is actually objective and not just a programmed uh, environment by robots that have taken over? And you might think this is silly, but the point I'm trying to make is that uh, the problem with praxeology, well, the point I'm trying to make is that um, uncertainty is so radical that we do not even know if uncertainty exists. And that is the fundamental paradox that will be the basis of, of my system of thought. So to, to, to sum up, the problem with praxeology is that he presents his system not as a subjective way of, of looking at reality, which would be subjectivist, that would be nice. He said, well, I'm not sure that I'm right, but I, I, I do think that this is a profitable way of looking at reality. But he, he, he posits it as an undeniable system because you cannot deny his axiom. And if you don't agree with his axiom, well, uh, he, he, he cannot say using his own terminology that you're irrational, but he, he might think it. I, I cannot put words in his mouth, but in my experience, Misesians tend to be quite radical. You know, if, some, if somebody is irrational not to accept their axiom, well, they don't talk to them anymore. Uh, well, I, I, I do think you, you know what I mean. So the paradox of subjectivism is, is that it must allow for its own denial. You have to leave the other person free because the moment you start defending subjectivism as the objectively best way to look at things, you, you enter in contradiction. So we, we have a very you know, strange uh, uh, problem there. So that, that is what I think is the problem with, with praxeology. To present it, not as a subjective way of looking at reality, but as the objective way. That to me is, is, a, is a bit of a contradiction. So how do we solve that problem? Um, I, was, I was fascinated by uncertainty. I tried to look up uh, definitions. I went, for, for, uh, of course, to uh, Frank H. Knight with his risk and uncertainty, but I didn't find a definition. Or I did find a definition, but it, it, I didn't like it. And uh, then I started uh, um, wondering, maybe uncertainty is, is so uncertain that we cannot even know if it exists. Maybe there's a pattern to everything, and then uncertainty would not exist. I will give an example of the paradoxes you end up with if you, if you go subjectivist. For instance, tolerance. The idea that all cultures can live together is based on subjectivism. You know, if, if, if you have your opinion and I'm mine, and we agree that you know, all, all we can hold is only opinion, then we can live together. But the, the, the paradox is that if you have to respect every opinion, then there might be opinion who thinks that subjectivism is bullshit. And so you, you end up trying to defend subjectivism as the most objective way losing your, your position, you're, you're losing your legitimacy because this person can always say, well, I thought you were a subjectivist and now you're defending subjectivism. I do think it's a general epistemological problem. I don't know why this goes so fast. I... So the, 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 the most fundamental paradox, and I call this the father of all insights, is that, that nothing is certain. Maybe we should take that as the axiom, a paradox. Um, Let's make um, um, an attempt to, to determine if uncertainty exists. What would you have to do? You would have to index all existing things in the universe. I think that would be the first step. Then you, have to, you would have to investigate if there are relations between those objects. And then you can see if there is a pattern in those relations. If there is a pattern, well, it's predictable. Then there is no uncertainty. But the problem with that is that you might index all planets and all trees and all everything, but you can never exclude that at the end of your universe, after indexing everything, there you have infinity. And within infinity, without, outside of our sight, 
there might still be objects. So if, if, if universe will be finite, then it will be easy. We just, we just index everything, we search for patterns, and we decide on uncertainty or certainty. But we do not even know if infinity exists. I know this is quite philosophical, but I will come to the relevance of this in the third part. So stick with me. <laughs> I will go one. Let me give one example of, of how uncertain uh, reality actually is. Uh, the most mm, profound uh, idea uh, in, the mo in modernity is that causality is, is certain. Uh, we think because uh, phenomenon B follows phenomenon A every time that we can conclude that causality exists. Well, at least at, since Hume, we should be very, you know, very uh, uh, careful uh, with that conclusion. Because uh, Hume, in my mind, is right when he says, well, it's not because correlation exists that we can derive causality. Causality is a different category than uh, uh, correlation. Causality is actually a psychological projection. Because you have had the experience that the sun rises in the east every day, well, then you think that there must be a, 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 um, a connection, a, um, a causal connection, and there is no proof for that. It might be coincidence every single time. And most people will think, well, that's far-fetched, but, you know, uh, far-fetched depends on where you stand. <laughs> that's what I think. So causality is a psychological projection, not a logical necessity. So then I started looking uh, for indications in Menger that if he would be aware of these things. And I found in Cauder that he worked in his old age on the philosophical foundation of his theory, which, due to the paradoxes of metaphysics, uh, became a failure. Well, that is a big question if it was a failure. Maybe he should have gone further and tried to derive what comes from uh, contemplating paradoxes. And my opinion is if, if we go forward with that, that we will arrive exactly where Menger was. Namely, with Catholic metaphysics. I don't know what, what happens, but... Okay. So, this is the, the, the end result of my research. And we, go, we will go step by step. So, this we have discussed already. The paradox of radical uncertainty. The second paradox we can derive from that. So, the author's concern would be Hume. Uh, this, this is... a. I discussed already. The next one we can, we can draw into this uh, way of thinking is Popper. Because the logical Because the logical con oh, so sorry. I, I really don't, don't do anything more than... I don't know what happens with this, but... It's... it's, it's Maybe, maybe you can do it because yeah. I, I, I'm so just... Which one is the one you want? Next one, please. Next one. Next one. Uh, go one back, please. Well, go one back more. This one I have called the father. The father of all insights. Why? Because if you accept the paradox of radical uncertainty, your whole method will change. You will not try to sell certain theory. Uh, go go two, two more, please, now. And why have I chosen this image? Because accepting the father, accepting this paradox, and now I'm going to start talking symbolically, which we should do as theorists, um, is a very difficult psychological process. Um, uh, if you have to accept that nothing is, is certain, well, then you might die the next moment. And much theorizing is actually uh, a way to compensate, I think, uh, this fear. People want to have certainties in life, and then they try to model those certainties. Go next one. But if you do accept uh, that nothing is certain, you could say that you become the son of a new insight. And I think one of the most important people who have achieved that is, is Karl Popper. Um, because his point is a bit that um, verification, so <laughs> positive confirmation of, of something uh, in the past, does not exclude the possibility that it will be uh, n not valid in the future. His criterion is falsification. He takes the negative side. He says, there is always the possibility that a theory we consider to be true today, that we think to be certain, well, is trumped tomorrow by a new fact that we haven't seen before. And like in the libertarian community, people dislike Popper because then you go to 
uh, relativism. Uh, there's no need to. I will show. I will show why there's no need to. But the, the central point is that <laughs> falsification only shows what cannot be true. It never shows what is true. It's not because you have uh, purified a theory from a contradiction, or if that you have adapted it to a new fact that you could not explain before. That, you're, that what remains is true. You don't know that. It might be that the day after, that also proves to be untrue. So, you have to take the attitude that everything remains a hypothesis until it's, it's, uh, it's trumped. The next one. So, in, in, in colloquial speech, you can say, you'll never know. So, that's the paradox of total ignorance. Uh, uh, and this is true for every theory, including this theory. So, that's why it's a paradox. Paradox is always... Uh, kick you in the face. You think you say something and then, then they hit you back. And that's because you go from the logical side to the psychological side. You, you make a, a statement and they say, well, well, if that is true, if, if everything is uncertain, well, uh, then you have said nothing. Or, or, or if, if you say that we cannot not know anything, then how do you know that? And, they, and modern, modern minds think that is a contradiction. No, it's a paradox. And the difference between uh, contradictions is that they uh, uh, refer to nothing and paradoxes refer to everything. I will come to that in my third part. So, now we have two paradoxes. We will arrive at the Trinity, but how? The first paradox, uncertainty is so uncertain that we do not even know if uncertainty exists. It might be that everything has a pattern. We don't know. We just don't know. The second paradox is that our ignorance about that is so fundamental that we cannot even ascertain if, if that idea is right. So, so these are two very subtle sides of the same equation. The one side is metaphysics, it's on the nature of reality an sich. And the other one is epistemology. What can we know about a radically uncertain reality? Well, one thing you could say is that a theory that is too formal could never identify an informal or uncertain reality. Wait a bit. Um, and now the question is, what is the relation be between those two? Well. The relation between two things can only be logical if the identity of those, thi those, thi those two things is, is fixed. The identity of, um, well, of, of uh, black and white is correlated to each other, because we know what black is and we know what white is. But a paradox is so, mm, so ephemeral that we cannot even determine its identity fixed. So the only relation between uh, the paradox of radical uncertainty and the paradox of total ignorance must be paradoxical. And now we can come to the, the next point to show you the, 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 the problem with, with measuring, with, with theorizing, uh, and, and the, the third paradox. Take a, um, a swimming pool and you want to measure the, the temperature. Uh, you, you do it with your hands and say, well, it's quite cold, let me measure it with my thermometer. And then you put in the thermometer to measure it. Well, the temperature that, that you will measure will not be the temperature of the water. It will be the temperature of the water plus the influence coming from the temperature that the thermometer has. So you never really reach objective reality. And this is a, a fundamental insight that has been, uh, you can go to the next, that has been um, uh, identified by Werner Heisenberg in, in quantum physics. And Menger actually has references to quantum physics. I will show this. He did it on, on, on a chemical level, on, on a level of electrons. He said one can measure the speed of a particle, but if you measure that speed, well, then you change the speed because you have to slow it down or, or whatever. Measuring something slows it down. Or you can measure the charge it has. But by because the, the, the apparatus that is measuring it also has a charge, you are changing the charge. So the relations between, between those uh, measurements are called uncertainty relations. One important point, we cannot confound these uncertainty relations with the indeterminacy, indeterminacy principle. Uh, uh, Heisenberg never talked about the uncertainty principle. If you look it up on Wikipedia, for instance, you will see the uncertainty principle. No, it's the indeterminacy principle. Next one, please. What is indeterminate? Well, impossible to determine. So, whenever you try to find out whether it is nature or nurture, if you, if you explain it in terms of nature, 
you will have to have a component about nurture. If you try to explain it in nurture terms, you will have to go to nature. If you try to explain the chicken, you will come to the egg. And if you try to explain the egg, you will come to the chicken. That is the third paradox. It's radical indeterminacy. It's a necessary indeterminacy. So next one, please. Indeterminacy means that factor A does not determine factor B, nor the other way around. It's actually the counterpart of, of causality. So in modern minds only think about causality. Everything has to be logically uh, explained, but uh, indeterminacy is just as, uh, as valid. And what is the paradox about that? Well, <laughs> it's necessarily so, it's determined that it is indeterminate. So it's radically unanswerable. Questions like that, chicken or the egg, uh, individual or society, uh, 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 does, in, does the individual make history or does the history make individual? You can, you can talk for days about that and you will never come to a conclusion because it's necessarily indeterminate. Next one, please. So the conclusion then is that everything is possible. That leaves a lot of freedom to theorize. If everything is possible, then you can never say that another person is wrong. The only thing you can say, because wrong is a logical category, it's one or zero. The only thing you can say is that, well, you might be right, but I do not think that this is a very probable uh, explanation. And in the third part, I will show why that is a, a much more fruitful way of debating. Because if there is one thing I, I do not like, it's, it's these kind of crispy debates between people defending their axioms, you know? What, what does that help anybody? So maybe we, we should start quantum economics. Maybe we should learn that, or, or, or think about uh, spontaneous order, for instance, as, well, that's my definition, uh, uh, spontaneity is the necessarily indeterminate relation between radical uncertainty and total ignorance. If you read, if you read Menger, for instance, uh, you, you cannot really say where his reasoning starts. He starts describing how money came about, and, and, and before you know it, you have, have it on the page, and you, you have the theory of, 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 of emerging properties and the theory of spontaneous order, but you can never pinpoint where, where did Menger start, and still it's good theory. So, what I call the second indeterminacy principle is a bit like what Heisenberg uh, said about the, the fact that you have to choose between speed and momentum. If you want to write good theory, you have to choose between uh, being certain, have a certain method, and still produce meaningful content. You can have a, a perfectly logical theory that actually has no relevance for, for anybody. And during the interview I had before this lecture, I, I, I said, you know, that maybe the libertarian uh, theory is very logical, but it does not appeal to, to many people. Maybe that's because we tend to be too much focused on the logical part and not enough on the psychological part. Because psychology, uh, psychological is whatever is logical in a context, and that context is individual. So whoever determines the context determines the logic. And we only discuss about the logic, so we will never get anywhere with that. So the full picture is, we have three paradoxes. Next one, please. And if you abstract that, we get this. Next one, please. Now, I can finally come to, why is this relevant? Why do we have to talk about metaphysics all the time? Well, finding all this, I suddenly had this like connection. I said, well, maybe, maybe there is a connection with the Catholic Trinity. Maybe it's the metaphysics of Menger that induced him to write such good theory. And my assumption, I will go to the next part now. So the relevance often for economics. Go, go further, yes. Well, we can go on because we've seen it. So the first fundamental insight I got is that our method is not determined by methodological debates. No, those methodological debates are just the function of our implicit assumptions. When two people start discussing with each other, they're trying to legitimize what they already feel. It's our psychological attitude towards reality in general that determines our method. We might change it, but in the end, somebody who, who has this socialistic feeling will remain socialistic, and other people who have the libertarian feeling will remain libertarian. 
So it might be uh, depressing at first, but I do think we have to be realistic about it. The fundamental insight number one is that our method is not determined by a logical theory, not by our explicit theory by, by, uh, about method, but by our, our psychological attitude towards life. So if you compare the attitudes that Menger and Mises have, well, Menger is a very modern man. He tries to legitimize his theory on a logical uh, uh, basis. And he said, well, psychological arguments, that's a bit, you know, a bit too, uh, uh, too ephemeral. Huh? He, he, he compares it to metaphysics and he's tried to do so. And, and again, I do not criticize Mises for taking this option. He's free to, to, to take this option and not another one. But I do think it's less profitable than that of Menger. He has no action. He excludes no, no field of theory and still he has profitable uh, 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 theory. Next one, please. So the fundamental insight number two is that this attitude towards reality, towards life, is determined by our metaphysics. Next one. So what, what do we know about the metaphysics of Menger? If you read the, the excellent book by, by Schulach and, and Unterkofler, uh, 2011, you can see that um, several references that he was raised in a strictly Catholic family. So strict even that he later you know, disavowed the faith, he, he left the faith, and his other two brothers, uh, one became a socialist, um, and the other one was a, was a liberal, and a liberal is not a Catholic, a Catholic is a conservative. So, uh, even though his um, later uh, um, explicit convictions might have changed, I do think that your upbringing, your, your general way of looking at life is determined in an early stage, and that uh, this Catholic metaphysics uh, has had uh, 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 an important influence on his research attitude. Next one. So maybe, could it be that, that these two things are, are connected? I, I have called the paradox of radical uncertainty the father. And I know that the dogmatic father from the Catholic faith is not the same as the symbolic father I use. That's a symbolic way of looking at things. If you accept the father, if you accept the paradox of, 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 of radical uncertainty, well, then you become a different person, you become a different theorist. So uh, you, become, you could say you become a son of that insight. And the connection between uh, you and uncertainty, if you accept uncertainty, then I, I cannot describe it uh, any differently than that the Holy Ghost visits you. You become very inspired, you, you find new ways of seeing things. It's, very, it's a very intensive process. So if, if we look at uh, the, uh, the literature, and I'm still, I'm still reading, and if anybody can find uh, uh, references for me, I, I would be very grateful. If you read Menger um, searching for the first paradox, he does not really theorize about uncertainty, which is actually a good thing, because if somebody would, would think that they can define uncertainty, then it would no longer be uncertain. So it might, we might see this as an Im implicit acceptance of uncertainty, though I cannot prove this. Oh, something went wrong. I think, no, I think I just, uh, yeah, it's, it's my, um, the second paradox, I, I, I use the same text, but uh, also the second paradox, uh, total ignorance. Um, the only thing you can say is that uh, I have the impression that Menger is much more modest than, uh, than Mises. Uh, uh, Mises, the first hundred pages of, of human action is like, uh, you know, uh, pulling punches at, at anybody, at, at Popper, at, at Hegel, at everybody he does not like. And very often I have the impression that he does not even understand what he's criticizing, especially Popper. Um, that is a separate point. But I, I do think that if Menger makes a comment on the German uh, uh, historicists, um, it's, it's a different attitude. But I have to substantiate that point. This is the weakest point of my, of my research at, at present. I'm, I'm only beginning. And then the third paradox about indeterminacy, this is the most interesting part, because Menger actually really talks about mutual causation. He says there is a view that the parts of a whole and the whole itself are mutually cause and effect simultaneously. So that is, that is an illustration of the third paradox, a view which has frequently taken root in the organic orientation of social research. And a bit later in the book, he even talks about uh, reciprocal, reciprocal conditioning. So. The idea that, that, that it goes both ways, that you cannot determine it. But, next uh, slide, um, <laughs> he, 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 this is the view. He says, you know, uh, it's a view uh, too vague to, 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 to use, 
And this is what I will have to prove that what I have said is not vague, that you can make it practical. This is what I will do now. But the point is, he could not see how he could make this practical, so he, he, he disavowed it. So now, let's, let's see what key insight he missed. I do think that paradoxes are the foundation of certain knowledge. On one subjectivist condition, that you believe in the paradox. So the quintessential human action for me is uh, uh, believing. Mises even, even says that there is no category in which, no central category in which you can explain human action. I, I do think that is possible. It is about subjective beliefs and we act on beliefs. That is the quintessential human action. So let's see why paradoxes are, are, are so good uh, to, to use as an axiom. Why are they so special? What is it about paradoxes that fascinates us, that we cannot grasp it, that, that escapes logic? I had to think a lot about this, but in the end, it is, about, it is because paradoxes are about everything. If I say nothing is certain, well, I am implying that uh, everything is uncertain. So I make, I make a, a statement about infinity, I make a statement about everything. So that also implies myself. It's not just about the object of, of what I'm saying, it also implies myself and my relation to the object I'm saying something about. So that is why I, I put a circle in, in dotted lines. Your logical proposition is not about a thing, but about everything. So it, it comes back to you, and that's what you experience when you try to you know, prove or disprove a paradox. It comes back to you. So while people would think it's a contradiction, well, you have to check if it is about everything. And if it's about everything, you can say it's a paradox. Then it includes you as well. The promoter of the proposition is included in the, the reach of validity of the logical proposition. Next one. So, for instance, uh, well, the point I, 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 I will try to make now is that every paradox has something as, it, as its essence and that something is infinity. So that is why, why they are so powerful. For instance, I told this before, Radical uncertainty, how can we know if it exists or not? Well, we cannot, because we need to know everything, every object in the, in the universe, and since uh, infinity exists, well, we will never be able to index all those objects. This, of course, depending on whether or not people believe that infinity exists, which is the super paradox, you know. Second one, um, go for next one, total ignorance. Why, why, what is the infinite, infinite aspect there? Well, you might have a theory which you think is true, but there are an infinite number of facts that might destroy your theory that you don't know yet. So that is how infinity is connected to the second paradox. And the third one is the most interesting one. The paradox of necessary indeterminacy. Where, where does infinity uh, uh, emerge there? Well, in trying to answer uh, what determines what, you end up with infinite regression. So always infinity is in the background. And so, next one. And so if you, if you try to abstract, we are already very abstract, we have three paradoxes, I know it's very abstract, but if we abstract the abstractions, then we come to a super paradox, namely, does infinity exist? If you believe that infinity exists, well, then everything becomes logical. If you're not, if you're not really aware about that, it's very, it's very confounding. Because to, wait a minute, because to exist is to take shape. This exists, Paul exists, I exist, but infinity, well, <laughs> it doesn't have shape, it's infinite, it, it's not finite. So to claim that infinity exists seems like the most contradictory thing you can think of. It's actually impossible to believe. And that's why I make the, the connection with, with, uh, with, with Menger's attitude. If you are raised Catholic, you are also required to believe something that is radically impossible. Namely, uh, the dogma of uh, 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 Jesus Christ rising from the dead. I am not claiming that, that, that Menger was aware of, of all these paradoxes. I'm not saying that. I'm only saying that if you can bring yourself to believe something impossible, then you transcend all logical categories. And then you might arrive at the research attitude that you need to be able to write good spontaneous theory. Next one. Yeah, I, I, I talked about that, uh, about the fact that it's not because you turn away from the faith later uh, that, that, that it does not determine your, your youth. This was the, the definition I gave about spontane spontaneity. We can go further. 
Uh, and now we have Denying Danny. I'm almost finished. Well, I have 10 more minutes. Uh, well, Denying Danny is the critical guy. He says, what do I do with this? You know, how can this ever be practical? And now I will deliver on the tension I have built. <laughs> or I, I will try. Next one, please. The, the central point is that if we change our assumptions about reality, if we change our metaphysics, then our method will follow suit. Our method will change as well. So you could call the, the, the Misesian mode of thought is a modernist mode of thought where truth is finite. We can reach it. We will, we will make a theory that is undeniable and then everybody has to follow that theory and then we will go to Valhalla. I don't know, uh, but, but this is the implication. It's based on a logically undeniable principle. Well, yes, it's logically undeniable, but it's psychologically deniable. You can deny it. And nobody can say that you're irrational because you can always use the argument that, 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 you know, that we cannot even prove the, if the other person is human. And you might say, well, that's far-fetched. But far-fetched is not a logical assessment. It's a psychological assessment. It's, it's as much as they, saying you're, you're, you're a pain in the ass. Shut up. And that's what I, I have experienced many times. Uh, Maybe because I'm too abstract. Um, and the goal is eternally valid knowledge. Now we have found uh, truth and that's what is going to stay forever. And the focus is entirely on possibility. The transcendental mode of thought, the mode of thought that I think Menger had, is totally different. It's, it is about a, 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 a contextually, contextually valid knowledge and whether or not it is probable. Let's go ahead. So to give one example. You have to make a choice between the cost of understanding a theory and the explicatory power of a theory. So the Misesian conception of rationality, for instance, is any action before, performed by man. But the more common conception of rationality, or then, then put on the other side, the irrationality, is to consciously maintain contradiction. I think that is a far more uh, a profitable way of looking at irrationality because it explains m much more uh, 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 phenomena. Next one, please. So I'm going to my conclusions now. Is Mises wrong? Well, no, no. If you make a judgment about that, well, you're, you're trying, trespassing against the second paradox. We cannot, he might be right. The only thing we can say is that his view is not as profitable. And I will come now to the practical part. Is it, well, is he profitable? Well, less than Minger. If you want to discuss Mises, well, you have to read a lot of Mises before you actually understand what he says. And there are enormous amounts of interpretations on what Mises has said, if he is a Kantian or a Neo-Kantian, or, you know, there's, we, we actually spent more time debating uh, how Mises legitimizes his system than actually applying it to, to reality. So once you have, even if you have acquired his, his point of view, the most common conception of what his point of view is, then, then you cannot apply it as, as easily as you would think you can apply it. You know, I do not see a lot of praxeological applications in, 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 in modern Austrian theory. I see a lot of debate about praxeology, but the applications, I, I do not see them. So I believe that we, we can go to a more profitable uh, uh, epistemology based on a different metaphysics. Because if you look at common expressions, you, you, you can easily see that that, that, that there's something economical about debate. You know, you spend attention, you borrow an idea, you buy an explanation, you, you pay tribute to a good author, uh, and if, if you have a good theory, well, it might gain currency. Uh, I think there is there's a lot of uh, references. Next one, please. And this, these are my basic assumptions, that the cost of a theory is expressed by the amount of the mental energy you have to spend to understand it. To understand Mises, you really have to study. To, to, to understand Menger, well, you just read his, his descriptions of reality and you might agree or disagree, but there is no big debate of, about his axioms because he hasn't had, had anyone, any axiom. And the value, on the other hand, is expressed by the number of phenomena it can explain. So if you, if you, if you choose what you want to learn, you, you just look at the profitability. It's the relation between the productivity, what it can explain, and the cost of understanding the theory. And I don't want to spend my whole life trying to understand an author. No, I want to use his theory to explain reality. That's, I think that is what we should do. So next one. No, go back, please. Okay. 
So the, the Mengerian method is projecting a subjective ideal type onto reality. He does not say that this is an axiom. He says, you know, this is an ideal type that I use and uh, let's test how profitable it is. And then somebody else can say, well, how do you explain this phenomenon then? Because your idea, it doesn't seem to explain that. And then you can adapt it. Actually, it's trial and error. So the ideal type is not an axiom. It's a subjective principle projected for testing. Let's evaluate that, how, how expensive that is. It's a very low cost of acquisition for such a theory. Anyone can, can start describing reality and asking other intellectual entrepreneurs, do you think that this is a good theory? Well, yes, but have you thought about this and that and that? And that is actually how, how real intellectual debate goes. You try to, you, you invite criticisms to, to, to better your theory. And how can you check the validity of a theory? Well, very simple. You, you, you see how much phenomena you can explain and you also look at how much, how much contradictions it, it, um, it contains. A theory with less contradictions is simply a better theory. So the profitability is very high. Menger's insights on spontaneous order, order and marginal utility are very widely applicable. Uh, uh, I think Mises gets a lot of credit for some reason, I don't know why. But the, the most important insights do come from the founder, which is Karl Menger. Next one, please. So the Misesian method is defending the axiom. In a, it's, it's all about, he has four books about method. All, all defending why his method is good. Okay, we get that. That's your subjective opinion. Now show me how you can apply it. And when, when we do try to apply it, well, it's not, it's not so profitable. Next one. So I, that's what I explained already. I, I will not bore you with, with, uh, with, uh, with more. Uh, so the conclusion for me, this is a quote that inspires me a lot. Uh, we, we tend to think that economic debate uh, is about price and, and, and all applied concepts. But, uh, and it is. But before you can reach that level of, of, of um, intellectual debate, you have to really talk first about your methodological assumptions. And your methodological assumptions are determined by your metaphysics. And metaphysics is a very abstract, ephemeral subject. And I have tried to, uh, to make it more clear to you. I have two more slides and then we're, we're done. Uh, next one, please. Next one. So, <laughs> my general uh, message is do not underestimate the power of metaphysics. Uh, I think Menger uh, was uh, highly influenced by his implicit attitudes, which made him a good theorist. Uh, uh, I think Mises was uh, uh, unaware of some of the most fundamental philosophical problems, which, for instance, is the problem of uh, 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 the non sequitur I have described, uh, solipsism, which does not imply I am a solipsist, but it is something you have to address. Uh, I think that is the la la last slide. Go, go further. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you for your attention. I know it was very abstract, but I... We have, now we have room for questions. Thank you. <laughs> Who will start uh, defending Mises, I guess, uh, because I'm in a, a Misesian uh, part of town. Well, you asked for uh, some references and extra yes, authors. So you say some ideas that remember me about Kuhn and Feyerabend. You probably have heard of them. Of and course, yes. You've read some. Mm -hmm. so for example, you're talking about this psycho hyphen logics. I found it similar to a uh, Kuhn uh, paradigm. Mm -hmm. So Paradigm shifts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, in general, yeah, I, I could say I, I agree with you. Actually, I have no, no questions. <laughs> okay. I just uh, wanted to, to comment this. Um, you say that Menger was more humble than Mises. In, a, in, in his sense, assumptions about in, reality. Yeah, Maybe in yeah. interpersonal yeah. relations. No, no, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's different. But uh, in his assumptions about I did, reality. I didn't met them, yeah. Um, so, I would say it another way. I would say that Mises was um, allowing himself to take in higher risks than, than Menger was. Because uh, Mises said, okay, we want to do it very solid. So, he was taking this kind of positivistic position. Even though he was 
against the physicalist position of the Vienna Circle and everything, but at the end that was a little bit positivistic. So it has pros and cons. The pros is that if you're doing it well, everything is going to be very solid. But if your axioms are not perfect, then you have this problem. Um, what you do to um, not taking this this problem is doing as, as Menger did. Okay, it was more liquid in this sense. Um, yeah. And the problem of that is that if you're not careful, you may end up without any element that allows you to decide if a scientific statement is valid or not, which is falling into relativistic yes. positions. So I was going to ask you, but you finally answered my question about which is the element of Menger. Economical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, okay. I arrive to a similar conclusion. Uh, I call it utility. Something is useful to explain something. Yes. This is... What I understand is the, the most valid element to prove that something is valid or not. So uh, I don't know if Menger did some more extra work. You can comment us about this economic uh, mm. element that uh, allows him to decide something is true or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for your remark. Uh, I, I, I do think that the way forward is to subjectivize uh, uh, the, the, the theoretical process without, of course, uh, falling into total relativism. So uh, if I say that the quintessential human action is believing, then we have to look for the most profitable belief we can imagine. And if anybody finds a more profitable belief, belief then we can say, oh, yours is better, because it explains more phenomena with less contradictions. So I, I think that should be the, the way we interact and not so much uh, uh, on an ideological basis, because once you start thinking that a subjective uh, way of explaining reality is the objective way, well, then you get, even within the libertarian community, you get, you know, political groups. <laughs> How contradictory is that, that we are trying to achieve liberty? And then, you know, you see factions which, which try to, to challenge each other. I don't think which we, this is the good way. I think we can make it collaborative. But thank you for your comment. And uh, I do think that, that uh, we, can, we can go on this Mengarian stretch without ignoring Mises because he has done a lot of good work but uh, but yes I think I think Menger is, is the way forward. Paul? Thank you. Two commentaries. One of them is uh, in what do you differentiate from pure uh, utilitarism like Bentham like mm. if, if you're if you're if your way to to approving or or to or to loving a, a theory is is how much utility does it have? How much how much results? Those are his words. I do not speak about utility. My I know, I know, yeah. but, but I know, but still, like you, all the time, you are argumenting about how uh, is more uh, profitable or more fruitful the Mangarian system than the Misesian system mm -hmm. because it gives more results, mm -hmm. more explanations of yes. phenomena. Yes. And so one commentary is about if you are an, an utilitarian or something like that. No. And the other commentary is about relativism. Mm -hmm. Like, if you, if you, I mean, like the eternal debate uh, since not even the Middle Ages, but before about uh, between realists and relat relativists mm -hmm. is, is that. I mean, the, the realists like St. Thomas Aquinas or many others said to relativists, mm -hmm. how, I mean, if, if if you have relativism as a base, you can't explain anything because you will always doubt about everything. So you, you, it's not, that's not profitable. That's not no. fruitful because you, you can't yeah. uh, be certain about anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, isn't, isn't it more profitable to, to have certain things and, uh, at least unless, uh, until someone contradicts them and, and refutes them and demonstrates it is false. But, but at least you have to live with certainties. If you don't live with certainties, I mean, uh, Mises was doing something normal, have certainty in something, so have some well, axioms. If you don't have axioms, how can you live? That's, that's, the, whole, that's the whole problem. That in modernity, we have started to think uh, that certainty is, is uh, well, certainty has become so important that we prefer believing in a theory that will give us certainty but is irrelevant because we if you believe in in, in a logically certain theory that you then you are not describing reality you are 
making it, you're influencing it. Imagine that Misesians would take control over government, well then they would put their subjective reality onto, onto uh, social reality. And you might think that's a good thing. But are you describing reality? Are you part? I think the biggest difference between Menger and Mises was that Menger saw him, himself as part of the spontaneous order. Well, when I read Mises, it's like he's describing uh, uh, reality and he's not part of it. He, he, there, modernity is characterized, I think, by the idea that reality is independent of the observer and then we describe it and nothing happens. Ever since quantum physics, I think we have to acknowledge that our interaction with reality is what is making it up, that the relation between reality and our conception of reality is more important than each of these parts. And I know that's, that's psychologically difficult because we think, you know, if, 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 there is no, if, if, if nothing is certain, then what must be belief? Yeah, I mean, what is the use of the thermometer to, to yeah. measure the water? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to have that certainty that it's measuring correctly. That is profitable. So if you don't, if you doubt about your interaction to measure reality, mm -hmm. then, then what is the purpose of having a thermometer? Like, mm -hmm. then do nothing in life, no? Mm -hmm. That, that well, is the danger of what you're saying, I, I think. Well, that's, that's the psychological danger, the, the, the fear, uh, w because what you express is fear that, that if we take uh, uncertainty as the axiom, and for instance, not human action, then, then everything is uncertain and, and all, all, all is uh, equal. And I say, no, that's not true. You, you do have a criterion, but it's an economical criterion. Your because your example about, about the thermometer is an example of physical reality. And physical reality is a lot less complex than social reality. Because social reality, uh, if enough people believe that uh, uh, fiat money is money, then it is money. So there is an, aspe an aspect of magic even in, in social reality. And so to have the deterministic discussions about social reality, trying to be certain, uh, I have never met a person uh, that was subjectivist that uh, used aggression against me. It's only people who think that their subjective point of view is the only correct point of view, they try to convince me. So it's very paradoxical that people trying to look for certainty actually make society worse than people who say, well, maybe you're right, I don't know, but let's get along. But it's different convince than to make an aggression. So that, that is the, the, the difference. You, you, that is because you, you think your objectivist way is the, and you want to impose it to the other one, so you ag aggress. But if you are subjectivist and you think yours is right and you have that certainty. Well, you don't. You think it's right. Okay, you're, you're but, sure. you, but you think that you have that certainty, then, then you can try to convince without being ag aggressive. Well, I, I don't convince people. I think it's aggressive. Why? Well, I don't. I, 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 start, I stopped doing that because I think it's a form of... Uh, you, you can convince a person, you can, you can slam arguments at them all night, and they say, yes, yes, Brecht, you're right. And then they go home, and then they say, what? And the next time you see them... You must have had this experience. Yes, many times. <laughs> many times. So, so. But sometimes it makes a, a seed no, that will the grow you there. Have to leave behind. I do believe in the Socratic way of discussing. If you see a contradiction with another person, don't say your truth because they're not interested. Point out the contradiction and make them doubt. And then leave them for two years and then come. <laughs> Brecht, what you, what you said back there about you know the. Uh, the, the triangle of deception about fiat money. Can you explain it again? <laughs> okay, but that I is a, that but is that is a psychological forward. method. But That's it's not. Yes, but, but it's not the philosophical uh, ground where you are standing. That is, you believe in certainties, and it's normal and it is human to believe in certainties. Well, the philosoph my philosophical ground is paradoxical, so I don't have a ground. Okay, I'm trying to That's convince you about the otherwise. <laughs> yeah, and it's not nihilistic. Maybe if you could go back to one slide, uh, the colleague in in the back. Uh, Gustavo, or, or could you go a couple of slides to, back to the, 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 the Trinity I, I, I posted? Uh, or you already left? Go back, go back, go back, go back until the Trinity is, is, is positive. Uh, that's far away. Well, one of those, yes. Well, uh, uh, you could say, well, you're saying that everything is radical, that we don't know anything, that everything is possible. Well then we're nihilists, you know, then, then any socialist can come along and say, you know, killing a hundred million people to realize my ideal, well, that was my subjective view. And uh -huh. then, I sh then I could not say anything else, uh -huh. you know, okay. That's not my point of view. My point of view is that this is an Aikido move. You know Aikido? Yeah. <laughs> the Aikido move is, 
is if every opinion is subjective, then I can hold the subjective opinion that subjectivity is the best way to look at, at, at stuff. It's not easy, but a nihilist, for instance, is trying to convince you that nihilism is true. Yes. So the contradiction is on him. I, I don't think it's an easy, it's, it, it's not an easy debate, but any nihilist trying to convince another person that nihilism is true is in contradiction. Any subjectivist saying, I personally believe in subjectivism is not engage, in, engaging in, in any contradiction. He's just saying it's valuable to me. It's a profitable way of looking at reality to me. And I will not force you. I'm a libertarian. I will not force you to agree with me. Uh, I think if libertarians would start doing that, they would actually get more people in, into the cause because it's very annoying at times. You know, those people just want to convince you. And, and it's a, for, for many people, it's aggression. So, but, I'm, to make my point absolutely clear, this whole system depends on one central point of belief, namely that infinity exists. And if you, if you, well, if you compare it to the Catholic uh, 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 Trinity, it would be that God exists, because I think it's a, that, that is a synonym. But that would lead us too far. I only had one hour to, to, to explain this. Maybe I should have devoted more time to prove why I'm not a nihilist, I'm not a relativist. I'm just saying that it's, it's about the method of interacting. If you try to convince another person, I think, I think that's wrong. Yeah, okay. That's only the psychological level. That's the psychological level, but I'm, what I'm trying to show with, with the triangle as well is that the basis of philosophy is psychological. So you're trying to find a logical system that is um, self-sufficient, and any logical system has a psychological context. You cannot dis psychology. And if you want to win the hearts of people, you don't talk logic, you talk psychology. That's what I think. Okay. How many time do we have for questions? 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Bursert. And I have a comment. I think actually uh, the methodology of Mises is more about economics. But it might be that for Menger, his methodology is more about general issues like a methodological individualism. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, it might be that uh, for Menger, that his thoughts include more things than mm -hmm. not only limited in economics. Uh, and I do agree with you that we have to apply more praxeology in the reality. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a very good case, uh, you know, the book uh, in defense of deflation by Professor Philip Bagus uh, is in this book, it talks about uh, the psychological reaction from the common people on the deflation and inflation issues mm -hmm. and why people, they prefer inflation, mm -hmm. not deflation mm -hmm. in the psychological perspective. And I think uh, this book is a very good ap application using not only praxeology, but also some psychological studies to explain the issues. Mm -hmm. And this is just a case. And as I said, I agree with you that we have to apply more. So uh, I'm, I'm, you know, when, when you were making the presentation, I was just thinking about what we can do more. For example, uh, like right now, Trump and Kim Jong-un are, are going to make a meeting in Singapore the next month. Uh, obviously, we cannot use only praxeology to explain mm -hmm. why they are going to meet. Mm -hmm. So we have to use some press, uh, psychological assumptions uh, or other science mm -hmm. to analyze that what what they two both are thinking about mm -hmm. the each other and mm -hmm. what are their real intentions. Uh, for sure, that we, we know the conclusion that uh, we don't need uh, interventionism, and we we need peace, and we need to protect the property rights uh, from people in Korean Peninsula. But it's not enough to analyze that if the talk between Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un will be uh, productive in the sense of uh, protecting the pri private mm. property rights. So uh, I think that, uh, so we, we have to, I, I think you are real right, we have to study more. It's, it's, it's not like that mm. we, are, we, we, are, we, are, we are against the misses or something, but the application uh, I think should be very important thing that we need to do right now. Mm. Yeah. I, I don't even think that, that praxeology has to be discarded entirely. The only thing I'm saying is that praxeology now is limited to the, to the logical contents of our mind. 
to the to the in, in purposeful action uh, uh, using uh, means to achieve ends. And this is the economical sphere. But Menger's perspective was not only economics. He was about uh, sociology as well. He, he had uh, uh, um, uh, the evolution of language. So I, I think, and, and even Mises said that, that economics was only the most elaborated branch of praxeology. So there is no conflict between, between trying to apply a praxeology in, in, in broader areas. But my, my contention is that if we limit praxeology to lo or, or if we uh, legitimize praxeology on a purely logical basis, we are far weaker than when we would try to legitimize it on a psychological basis. If we, if we start from a certain axiom, while anybody can point out that it is not certain because you use psychological assumptions about the humanity of others, then we're weaker. If you admit upfront, well, this is only uh, an assumption, but it, it proves to be a very profitable assumption to explain uh, uh, economical, sociological, sociological, cultural reality. Well, I think that's a very, very um, strong position because nobody can come and say, well, your, your legit legitimization sucks. Nobody can say that. You don't pretend more than, than you can know. You're modest. So I don't, I don't want to discard praxeology whatsoever. I just want to, I, I would like to see that it, it, it is put on a psychological basis. Like, like Menger has tried to do for the, he has rewritten investigations over and over again and he never finally published his, uh, his rewriting because he was confronted with these paradoxes. And he thought, well, you know, since these are paradoxes, I cannot do anything with them. Paradoxes don't, don't teach me anything. And, and what I have tried to show is that if you reason true, 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 true through the paradoxes, you actually arrive at the metaphysics he believed in or was influenced by. So I, I, I'm not sure that this will ever, you know, evolve or, or, or be accepted by the scientific community, but I, I think there, there might be some, something in here. So if I'm in the, in the uh, I'm in the, how to see this in English, if I'm in the committee for seeing your defense, I would, I would say that this is, would be a very excellent dissertation. Though that I, I, I don't know if the correction, uh, the, the conclusion is correct or not, but it's yeah, very original, it's very interesting. I yeah. don't know, we'll see about that. I still have three years to, to make amends if it's not good enough, but I hope not. More. Well, <laughs> Well, um, it seems to me that uh, the definition you made of an axiom uh, is equivalent to the definition of an analytic proposition. Uh, I wanted to ask you if is that so and uh, what motivates this definition? Um, so an, an analytical proposition is a proposition that is true by virtue of, of, its, of its meaning, its, its in inherent meaning. It's, it's not true by ver like. Uh, a, a bachelor is a married man, so, so that, that is a proposition that is analytical uh, because uh, it is implied in, in the phrase. It does not make reference to, to empirical content. That's, that's an, we first have to agree on what is an analytical proposition because you know, we have whole debates about that as well, which I do not consider very productive in trying to explain reality, but okay. Um, um, well, then we could start uh, with subjectivism applying subjectivism on Kant, because what, what is an analytical proposition to one person might be synthetical to another person. A person not knowing, for instance, uh, uh, what a wedding is, like a child of five years does not know what, what matrimony is, for, for, for them that would be a synthetic proposition. So uh, to me, uh, Kant is too much too objectivist, but that's a different story. So no, I don't think that, that uh, uh, analytical propositions and axioms are the same. An axiom is a starting point of thinking that legitimizes itself by virtue of the fact that you have to use it to deny it. So you would enter in performative contradiction. You would say, well, this axiom is not valid. And while trying to prove it's not valid, you're using it. And that's why, why human action is so appealing, you know, because it's a very appealing thought that denying is a human action. So, so so you have the feeling that you are entering into contradiction. And this is all true as long as you assume that the other person is human too, which is not something you can prove, which is a psychological projection. So my, my critique is pretty refined, but I, don't th I do think it's valid. Um. 
Take Maybe away. now no. Paco can uh, can come in for the kill. Hey, I don't know whether I should do this in English or Spanish. Spanish, well, you also maybe, understand. Maybe in English because people Better are following in okay. on, uh, for, okay. online. Thank you, Brecht, because this is very, very interesting. All the issues you have touched are very, very interesting. And uh, th there, are, uh, there are some things that are highly valuable, others that are a bit problematic. Okay. The first thing that I would say that in order to criticize Mises, you do not need to go to Menger. And I don't see much, I, I don't understand why you do it. I mean, maybe it's because it's the typical thesis, you are in the Austrian school, and then you want maybe to compare two authors. The thing I see is that um, Mrs. and Menger do not study the same things regarding what you are dealing with. It's true that they coincide in some issues. I mean, Menger is probably one of Mrs. teachers or, or precursors or whatever you want to call it. But then Mises does something that Menger does not do. Mm -hmm. Menger's, I think Menger like wrote what? less. Mm -hmm. Menger wrote about money and also the principles of economics. And of course, as you have said, Menger dealt about sociology, psychology, mm -hmm. economics. Uh, Mises goes kind of a, a, a step further or a step down, saying, OK, I, I want to ground all this mm -hmm. philosophically. Mm. And he fails. We can discuss that. Okay, let's but discuss that. The, the thing is, Menger does not do that. Menger describes many things brilliantly. Mm. I, I'm not mm. uh, dismissing Menger. Menger mm. is a very interesting uh, yeah. uh, thinker, but uh, it's not uh, that Mises and Menger are against each other. It's no, I've never said that. With, yeah. uh, with different mm. uh, things. Mm. So one thing that I found interesting, when you had to defend something that Mises said it was very easy because we all know what Mises has said and where he has said it mm. and how he thinks about many issues. But about Menger, you had to, to go like to secondary references mm. of people thinking about what Menger might have mm. thought. Mm. That's so the nature Menger of did the... not study those things specifically mm. and we just have to infer what he might have thought about those issues. Mm. That is a bit Mm. At least dangerous, but m m mm. maybe you're, you're right, and maybe these people are right, but m since Menger did not do it himself specifically, there will mm. always be... There we have a lot less information about Menger than we do have about Mises, that's, uh -huh. that's a, a basic point. Yeah, yeah. Um, but to comment on your first uh, intervention, um, they do not talk about the same things. You say, well, <laughs> the, the, the gist of the problem is that Mises thinks it is necessary to legitimize uh, economic theory on a on a on a logical basis. Yes. Have you read Have you read Guido Hilsman's uh, biography of him? Well, the first part, yeah, the first chapters. But then my point is that Menger does not feel that necessity. And then it's very easy to say, well, well, Mises is more, you know, elaborated because he at least can legitimize where he's coming from. And what I am saying is that if you have a metaphysics like that of Menger. It's so evident, some, kind, some things are so evident, when we read an author like of two centuries ago, it's better to look at what he does not say than to what he says, which is very difficult because you can interpret whatever, but you have to look at the cultural context and the cultural context of Mises was liberal. The, the cultural context of Menger was strictly Catholic. So the, the common conception of reality was a shared Catholic conception following well, the Trinity is one of the most central things in, in Catholic dogma. Well, you can discuss with Catholics, but I, I think, Paul, the, the Holy yeah, Trinity... Yeah, what, what I'm saying is that yeah. there, I, there I think, for instance, that you go too far. Because I don't see that there is so much difference between the cultural background of Mises and the cultural oh, background of Menger. Oh, enormously. That's a point of contention we have. I think what there I are day and night when it comes to culture. M Mises is a modern thinker. Uh, uh, Menger is not modern at all. He's a classical... Uh, 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 well, Aristotelian thinker, but I don't want to go into the discussions on Neo-Kantianism and, and Aristotelian. I want to look at the cultural atmosphere and the basic assumptions that people share about reality, those determine your method. It's not your theory about method that determines your method. That is already a rationalization. Maybe, maybe. Well, so I don't think it's a good critique to say that, that, that Mises would be more elaborate than, than Menger. I think a lot of things that were evident in Menger's time were not so evident in Mises' time, because a liberal society 
always needs defense, you know, and you try to legit legitimize as, as, as much as possible. So that is why uh, Mises appeals to, to thinkers, because he's a thinker as well, and Menger seems to be a guy that is just applying stuff. And still I do think Menger, Menger has a better theory. <laughs> I, I think that's debatable, I mean, that's a okay. historical issue. We might uh, do it if, if we have time. I think that's uh, a detail, but maybe for you it's very important. It's the essence for what me. What I want <laughs> to go is, at, at some point Guido Hülsmann describes Mises and what he's trying to do perfectly. He says that Mises had a period of depression, that he thought he was worthless or something, something like that, I don't remember the details. Okay. And then he says something typical of a hyper-rationalist. I want to build economics from the ground up mm -hmm. and I want to make it fully certain. Yes. I want to talk about things that are apodictically true. certain mm -hmm. and he I don't think he invents those words, but he uses those words that are not mm. common usage words. Mm -hmm. But they are if you go to kind of deep logic, deep philosophy. So it's a psychological motivation. But not cultural. It's, it's just his way of being. There yeah. are people who mm. are like that. Mm. They are kind of afraid of uncertainty, afraid of grace. They mm. want the black and white. Mm -hmm. They want to have the perfect argument. So Menger's descriptions are very, very high quality descriptions. But they're, they're gray, but they're probable. No, not only that, I, I'm saying Menger is speaking about economics in general, about exchange, about money. Mrs. wants kind of to go deeper. It's mm -hmm. like a philosophical ambition, like I can go deeper than you. I can, I can give the groundings mm -hmm. of your work. It's not that your work is, is yeah. wrong. I can give you the grounding. Mm -hmm. And he goes to, okay, human action, the action of, of human action. Um, but do you see that the result of that is that we start discussing more about those philosophical uh, foundations than actually applying economic theory? Well, I think Mises does both. Mises wrote a lot. If, if Mises was, had been only an epistemologist, mm -hmm. I would have said that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Mises has problems. One of the problems is that his epistemology is not as strong as most Misesians thinks, think it is. Mm -hmm. I think that Mises and praxeology, I have described it as a black hole. Mm -hmm. And this is going to contradict your cost, cost mm -hmm. theory. I, I think it's extremely easy to understand Mises, as li at least superficially. I, I could explain human action and international intentionality or mm -hmm. teleology very easily. But then when you start using words like apodictic and versus mm -hmm. hypothetical, hypothe mm -hmm. that's where the problems come. Yes. But those are not so hard if you're really, if you're really interested. At, and those are not... Uh, so so necessary when when you read Mises a second and third time you say hey this is everything obvious it's just that at the beginning it seems very complex but but, mm. but it is not the problem is that he insists on dealing with certainty and proving proving everything very logically mm -hmm. and as you said it is not that what he says is false no. it is not that what he says is wrong but then I would not go to Menger I would use other words things that I have been working on for years is that what he says is very vague, very incomplete, very generic. I mean, you can say it's truth, generic. Uh, I mean, they, yeah. are, they are logical, general. They, they are like, like skeletons. Mm. They like the meat. They lack mm. the details. Mm. That is why I am always accusing the praxeologists of what they say may be true, but maybe not relevant. Because it is like saying, what, how tall am I? Well, I am between one centimeter and one kilometer tall. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it's not relevant. But it's, it's not very precise. Mm. So when they discuss economic issues like the business uh, cycle, they say, oh, it has to be the central bank and central bank uh, man mm. credit manipulation. Okay, I can see your reasoning, but mm. your reasoning is so abstract, so vague, it lacks, it lacks, it lacks, it lacks intensity. Mm. So I don't know how strong the effects you're, going, you're talking mm. about. Uh, but mm. This is a detail. So th the problem with Mises is that, that he insists on, on, on being there. So how would I do the thing about dealing with Mises? Complementing his ideas, I mean, seeing his problem, and, and then what I'm trying to do this, this years, uh, these late years is you need to understand biology, you need to understand agents and action in general, not only human action. Mm -hmm. uh, also, there's a word that you have barely uh, used that is intentionality. Uh, you have, Mises says rational action. Mm -hmm. We can discuss the, the, the definition of rationality later. 
uh, what you need is cybernetics, because mm -hmm. cybernetics is a theory of control of action. Okay, but now you are talking about fields of application, or fields of interest. I want to stick to method. What, what is the method that I recognize in Menger? Does he have an axiom from which he derives the whole body of economic theory? No. no. What does he do? He says, well, I think this is ideal, ideal typical for reality. So I describe reality. And then he's open. I think this is an intellectual process that any writer has. Then he tests his theory. Then he says, in your mind, well, can I apply this? Yes. yes. Oh, this, this I cannot apply. Then you adapt your theory. And why do I believe that is a better way of looking at that? Because it is very open to contributions from other people. A true Misesian cannot be open. He has to defend his axiom. He has to defend the logical steps derived from that axiom. And he even has to defend that some arguments cannot uh, disprove his theory. Psychology, I'm very sorry, but praxeology does not uh, uh, accept psychological arguments. And for a Misesian in his system, that is okay. But if we are talking about relevance, well, then we have a problem. So I think we agree, Paco, for the, once. The, 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 the problem with the musicians, you have said, it, is that it's not that they are wrong. It's not that what they, what they say is false. It's that their world is very small. They only look like at the core mm -hmm. of reality. They give an abstract description of humans. Yeah. Mrs. does it. Rothbard does it not only in, in his economics, but on, also in his ethics. They only see humans as rational, intentional actors. They say psychology. Psychology exists, but, but it's the not truths a field. of, of psychology yeah. are independent mm -hmm. or like complementary to mm -hmm. the truths of of, of praxeology. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, that's true. Mm -hmm. But then, what I would say: intentional action is not only human. Animals have intentional action. Electrons have it. No, mm, I you so. need you need to have some control mechanism, and mm -hmm. in order to. Uh, you need to be a, either a living being or a machine produced by living beings in order to direct that action. That it would take a bit long to explain uh, all that. So that's your subjective view, I presume. <laughs> Again, uh, let, let me just say say one thing. I think if you start a conversation with people about the axiom of human action, they will listen uh, intellectually. They will listen because they think it's a nice a nice way of talking. If you start a conversation with Nothing is certain. That is, that is much more inspiring to, to start, I think, in, on a purely strategy. I'm not now talking strat strat strategy. And if you can show to those people that even if you reason more and more and more in, in a paradoxical way, that you can arrive at certainties, well, then, then you have them, I think. Uh, you have said something regarding the paradoxes. You have said something much better than nothing is, is certain. You have said. That's something that is very important, probably one of the most important things in what you have said. We cannot even be sure whether we are certain or not. That's the paradox we of We cannot radical even be sure whether paradoxes are problems that can be solved or not. Mm -hmm. We are working on it. Mm -hmm. So science, science is about objective knowledge about reality because it tries to push the subjective aside not denying that there are subjects, that there are people who have opinions, but trying to eliminate the biases that might be included by their emotions, by the limitations in their cognition, in their perception, in, in their point of so view. So science is objective in your mind? Science tries to be objective, of course. It's based and, on and, a subjective And the belief. measure of success in science is how much how, how well uh, you can do that. And there are techniques to do that, mm -hmm. but you have to either do science or be a bit advanced in the philosophy of science about how science achieves mm -hmm. objectivity. I usually use a different word for all these problems. When you say certain, uncertain, I say, uh, science, all human knowledge, what you call opinion or beliefs, is about two things. It's about states of mind and it's about things about language. There's, uh, the other thing that is missing about cybernetics and knowledge is language. Mm -hmm. Is that things are not perfect. Everything has problems. Mm -hmm. Even Mises' theory, will, uh, well, I would say we can be certain that uh, intentional rational action exists. I would say that it, it has problems because we are using language, we are using words, mm -hmm. and maybe we don't agree about the meaning of those words. Mm -hmm. So maybe we are not communicating perfectly. Okay. Maybe we are not clear enough. Because I think 
well, true. No, I, I, I don't want to make a point. I want you to make your point. Because I don't see where you're going. Uh, uh, when, uh, I, I don't know when. when maybe, don't, <laughs> no, maybe you're not certain. Maybe you're not certain. Ah, about certainty and uncertainty. Uh, certainty and uncertainty are not zero or one. It's a question of degrees. That's true. It's probable. So science tends, science tends to advance. Science tends to produce in better, terms of in terms of what that's, better, that's, better observations, mm -hmm. better uh, theories, better models, because they describe reality better, they explain it better, they connect things better with more precision, with more clarity, they predict better, they give they give people more power. So there are tests of how much better they are. So it, it is true that. Uh, but man, man, man is not just a rational animal. Uh, I, I think when you talk about meaningful theory, uh, that, that's what I'm trying to show with the, the third paradox. You can have scientifically, logically precise theory, which is t so, so uh, um, hermetic that outside of this community of people who believe in this scientific theory, it has no relevance. Sure. That's, but I think we're saying the but, same, but, and I but, think but, the but organizer but, would like but, to but, stop. But how are you using the word relevance? Relevance, one, relevance for everybody, universal relevance. But relevance is uh, is just an issue of what people like, what people prefer, no, or what relevant they, what, what they find that you meaningful. have forgotten something very important that you have not included in your theory, okay. independent of whether people like it, independent of whether people care yeah. about it or not. Let's do this on, on uh, tomando cañas, vamos a. Ah, well, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, Ashwater one that, uh, has a question. Do you think that quantum mechanics can be applied to consumer theory or reduce theoretical uncertain uncertainty? Quantum mechanics can be applied to? To consumer theory to reduce theoretical uncertainty. The, the essence of, of quantum mechanics is probability. It's, it's not about... Uh, ones or zeros, but everything that is in between. And maybe you can give me some context on why you think that this might be relevant, because I suspect that you have tried to find the most difficult question that I could not answer. <laughs> what, where does this question come from? Because I don't see the link right now, but if you give me some context, I might see it. It's, just that it's an internet question. It's just an in internet question. Aha! Yeah. So. <laughs> okay, then, then we should ask those, that person to, uh, to elaborate, but it will take too long, I guess. Uh, try, can you read it again? Sorry, I try. Sorry, uh, I, may I? Uh, my <laughs> well, no, might no. I, I well, it might. It might be a troll question. I'm just saying that it might be a troll. If I don't have context, it's very difficult to, to answer a question like that. You know. Is there any anybody else who wants to ask a question? Because Paco, you will. Yeah. I, I mean, when when. But is, is there anybody who wants to ask another question besides Paco? That's no, no, my I question. I, no? I wanted no. okay. to give you kind of warning about these kind of questions. I okay, mean, okay. Some, some questions, sorry, it might be serious, but I think it is not. I mean, trying to connect quantum mechanics with, con with, very in with consumer now. preferences, yeah. I think it is not very serious. Choice theory, for instance, might be a, a link, but I don't really see a link right now. But Okay. So, so it's, it's actually a question for Paco, but it's more <laughs> in the context. Okay. <laughs> okay. More in the context. It's uh, what I was explaining before about uh, this element that allows us to decide if a statement is valid or not uh -huh. from a scientific point of view. Which one do you think is the right one? You understand which, of, of which, which element? Are? For example, I proposed utility. Something is. We accept it as valid if it's useful to explain a phenomena okay. or something. Well, oh. mm. which, which is the element that you consider that it's what you need to prove that something is true or not? What do you need to prove whether something is true or not? Yes. De de depends on your definition of truth, uh, for starters. T truth is a property not of words. Truth, truth is a property so of statements. So if you say, is, it, is utility truth? Utility is a word that has a definition, and then it may be fruitful, it may be useful in theories, but then the statements in the theory are true or not. How do you know if 
they are true or not, where truth is correspondence with reality. Well, you well, have well to let me intervene on that. Let me intervene on that. What I've tried to show is that, or maybe I didn't show it enough, is that modern truth theory is indeed the correspondence theory. You have objective reality, you have the subjective observer, and then the interaction between them, that's not very important. What we, what we know since quantum physics is that it is all about the interaction. So your truth theory uh, cannot be uh, 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 logical. It can only be probable. So, so if you think that truth can be arrived by uh, logical ratiocination, you will be very disappointed. Because, because truth, I think, is true. But yeah, I think truth is transcendental. But that's another. That's not another subject. It's actually what is behind this. What you are pointing at with your paradoxes, which are very interesting is that there are domains of reality where truth is difficult, where truth is much more problematic than it seems. But that does not mean that all of reality is like that. I mean, there are truths in certain domains where you can look at the sentence, look at what is said, then look at reality. Logical truths. No, but I'm not speaking about logical truths. Truths in general, let's count how many people are there. If say, okay, we are 18. Can we check whether we are 18? I don't know the number. Yes. So we, we, can, we, we understand what the, what the words mean, we start counting and say, oh, no, the, the, the statement was true or the, or the statement was false. Mm -hmm. Their truth is possible because mm -hmm. it was relatively mm -hmm. easy. Mm -hmm. If you say, is the, infin is the universe finite or infinite? Wow. Truths so, there probably are difficult mm -hmm. maybe unreachable. Mm -hmm. They're completely, yes. completely agree. So, but you would agree that the, the latter kind of truth is comprehensive for all truths. So infinity must be the biggest thing between brackets that we can imagine. So all local truths, I think they will be smaller than the big truth, you know? <laughs> but okay, let's, this is things for, for, for the bars, for when you have canyas. Now I would like more, more point, pointed questions. I would say that, that you can easily count, okay, there, here there are 18 people, but you don't know if uh, this girl is pregnant. So. Maybe this 19, and you don't see it. It's just sometimes it's not, it's not so. You, we, we have the temptation to think that things are very easy, but mm -hmm. then normally are more complicated than what they seem. But uh, I was going to say something else about quantum physics. Um, I have like two versions of quantum physics. One of it is that you modify reality when, let's say, let's say when you measure it, mm -hmm. but then there's, Another version that says, no, you modify reality when you look at it, when you observe it, mm -hmm. just observing. Observing is not the same as measuring it, because I can understand yes. that measuring, you can modify yes. as with a mm -hmm. thermometer example. But observing, really, do you modify reality? Mm -hmm. I think you should have to prove that if that was true, no? Um, what what uh, I want to mean with that, uh, if truth... In a classical definition, truth is the adequation of the mind to reality. That's the modern definition. That's not the classical uh, definition. Well, That's the whole point. Wh what do you think is the, the classical definition? I think the classical conception of truth is transcendental. That truth is, is, uh, is uh, um, how you say that, <laughs> is above all abstraction even. Uh, yes, it, it, you cannot it, grasp it in, in finite but terms. But because it's superior than human mind. Yes. So the, the okay, the real the classical. Idea, the, yes, but the modern, the, the modern idea is that we can uh, logically determine truth, and I do not deny that for for practical uh, things. Uh, but uh, to, to say that this is then the final truth? Uh... But no, I think there are two levels. One is the level of, of truth, let's say with, with a caps with, letter. With a little t and a big t. Yeah. The big t. And it's transcendent because it's, it's beyond humans and, and human cannot uh, grasp it really. Yes, like okay? infinity, for instance. Oh, yeah, like infinity. It's, it's beyond, so you can't. But, but uh, in, in, a, in a normal way of saying truth is when, when a person... Uh, uses his mind to observe reality and to and to know reality as it is. And the modern, the modification of medieval ages and, and classical theory was no, no. The human mind can modify reality. Humans co uh, control and 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 build reality. And uh, let's say medieval thinking was was no. We are more humble. 
we don't build reality, but we know reality. Reality is, is, is um, outside humans, and, it's, uh, and, and you can only like know it and describe it the better you can, but never 100%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just lost my point of where I was going, but uh, I think it was something air. about well, yeah, your, your definitions and with you between you and, and, and Paco about about truth and 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 how and, and the relationship with with quantum physics as, as how can you really modify reality by, by just observing? Well, the, the the most recent experiments I, I have I I'm not a physicist, but from what I have read the idea that it is the observer uh, um, observing that changes the thing it's not just with uh, conscious uh, objects even if they put a, a regular object it still has an influence a, a quantum influence and my hypothesis but this is very don't take my quote for this is that every object radiates uh, energy it radiates a frequency and when those frequencies collide they might uh, uh, create a particle because one of the things in modernity is to think that matter is, is the thing to be, like modern physics is about matter, while you could say that classical physics uh, uh, is about energy. Uh, um, and so your question is not about economics and <laughs> by, by, by far, but I do, th I do understand your point that, that uh, um, observing reality, you, you do actually do not believe that it, that it changes reality. I don't think, but I am open to think if someone demonstrates it. Yeah, well, it has been demonstrated, I guess. I, I have but seen is, some videos we, about I, it, and I, I, I don't have the feeling the that we are just, you know, yeah. way, you know, and I know it's an abstract thing, so if you go high, you go, go, go far, but we have to, you know, stick a bit, and I think we're practically finished. <laughs> I'm thirsty, that's why. Uh, you, sorry, you have five uh, more minutes. We have paid for five more minutes. Oh, yeah, thank you. We have paid for five more minutes, and we started ten paid minutes. For five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we started ten minutes late, so. That's <laughs> true. Uh, yeah, break please, some, some more water. Good modern science does not ignore the observation and the measurement problem. It just includes it in science. Well, that's so very good, recent. Good. Nineteenth no. century science did not. Yeah, yeah, of course, but twentieth, not twenty-first, twentieth century science recognizes the problem of the observer, mm. and. It knows that the measurement, like the, the thermopinter, creates a problem because it either adds energy to the water or mm -hmm. takes energy so, to the water, so it changes the temperature. Thank you. But it can be uh, defended that you can make the measurement uh, delicately enough so that the alteration that you cause on the observed thing is basically irrelevant because there are okay. errors of measurement okay. anyway. And so what is your you, point? You can reduce. So, so that, that these things are not always, again, that these things are not always that important. People tend to think, oh, we cannot reach truth because when we observe reality, we change reality. Science already knows this. And then what, what science produces is theories or models that include not only the things observed, but the observers themselves. And as I was telling you, in cybernetics, there's one thing that is called second order cybernetics, which is how do you represent not only the things, but the observer and thinker thinking of and observing about the thing. And you can even yeah, have but, but third the order But the person writing that theory of second uh, layer uh, cybernetics is an observer as well. Of course. So you end up with infinite third regression. And this is the point I have been trying to make, yes. that, that even logic, a whole logical theory is based on a psychological projection. So my point stands. What, what I'm trying to say is that this process, it is possible that this process converges, that, that the corrections that you are doing every time are minor, minor, smaller and smaller and smaller, so that you have a better and better view of reality. So that, again, that that problem exists, mm -hmm. but it is not, may, maybe it's not an unsolvable problem. Okay. And, and, and the last thing about rationality. Mm -hmm. You talk about intentionality, and I have to uh, say something about that. Mm -hmm. Menger was very influenced by phenomenology, by Franz Brentano, and one of the central concepts in Brentano's philosophy is intentionality. So even there, if you would say that Mises' uh, rationality can be interpreted as intentionality, even there, I don't think Mises is, is so relevant. You, could, you can do perfectly what you do with Mises with Menger. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, the, mm -hmm. Mises is not the only thinker, philosopher, or economist who has dealt with intentionality. Probably he's the one who has done it 
more deeply and also in the Austrian tradition. What I mean about inter intentionality is just a detail. When, when, when people say, okay, I can find a person that can deny rationality. Mm -hmm. Like, I am not acting uh, rationally or I do not act rationally. But simply that statement could be wrong. It could be false. It, I mean, it's not about being able to say certain things. It's about whether those things are true or not, whether the, your reasoning or your argumentation is correct or not. Mm -hmm. and, and rationality has two or even three meanings. I could recommend many modern books about why humans are rational. What Mises means with rationality is that people have reasons for what they do. They have motives. Well, that's what I said about meaningful. And, and the other so, thing is that they reason about what they do, they think about what they do, they, once, when they ha once they I, have I decided they, they want to... I think they don't. I think they rationalize after the facts. Yeah. That's okay. a possibility, but, but that's... I think it's, it's time to go uh, to the cafe uh, to meet you in another capacity. I, I just... <laughs> I just want to point out that Paco has exactly the same attitude that says that Mrs. Half. Is just de um, digging deeper and deeper, and you know, you remind me of uh, Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> That's a compliment for him, so yeah. don't do that with me, you know? <laughs> okay. Vale. Bueno, muchas gracias. Thank gracias. You lot. Muchas gracias a todos. Eh, aprovecho para invitarles, eh, por una parte, el próximo viernes, la próxima conferencia de Domingo Soriano que será sobre pasado, presente y futuro de los medios de comunicación. Eh, va a hablar pues, un poco, un repaso de, de... Habla de la crisis, de internet, posverdad e ideología. Todo eso en relación con medios de comunicación, seguro que va a estar muy interesante. Y por otra parte también eh, invitarles a apuntarse eh, no solo a la Cena de la Libertad, que será el día 1 de junio, sino también a la convención que es al día siguiente, el día 2, el sábado, eh, a lo largo de todo el día, en la sede de UFM Madrid, eh, en Arturo Soria 245, eh, la impulsa el Think Tank New Direction en colaboración con Juan de Mariana y colaboran muchísimas organizaciones eh, liberales, sobre todo españolas, y, y bueno, va a haber muchos paneles y creo que va a estar muy interesante. No, vamos, se pueden apuntar conjuntamente a la cena y la convención. Y nada más, muchas gracias y hasta la próxima semana. Gracias.